All right, folks, as you heard, we're talking about additive manufacturing today. We're coming to you live for the first time, technically live. We yeah. live, what, 20 minutes apart, but it's the first time we're shooting it together in the same spot. 139 episodes in for the first time we're shooting together. So if there's bumps, it's because we're nervous to be in person. Yeah, I just, we don't really look at each other. You know, we look at screens. And yeah. Here we are being graced by each mm-hmm. other's presence. Now I've got to look at for both in the I eyes know. and take it's the It's a heat. special moment for us both. <laughs> All right, but before we get started with today's episode, let's talk about today's sponsor, right? We got Mauser Electronics. You guys know we love Mauser. And the reason we love Mauser is because they're one of the world's biggest electronic distributors. What that means is they get to work with a lot of cool industries, a lot of cool partners. And they wrote this really interesting technical resource that's super relevant to today's article, right? They're talking about additive manufacturing, specifically how it ties into Industry 4.0. Now, what I like about this specific resource in comparison to all the others, like the different articles that I have out there, is they walk you through the changes from like what, is, what we consider industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And they talk about how the trend has typically been, you know, centralizing all the manufacturing resources to a plant, then making it more advanced, yada, mm-hmm. yada, yada. But with the emergence of additive manufacturing and all this computer tech that we have, to some extent, it's kind of moving out out of like a centralized location and going into on sites, like into people's homes even. Yeah, it's like the democratization of manufacturing technology. And I'm kind of a testament to that. I have a 3D printer right there that I do. It's like for hobbyist stuff, but we've used it for some projects as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It really spoke to me maybe, again, because I'm a hobbyist, because I enjoy fiddling around with hardware, or maybe it's because we use it so much during senior design. Um, But for anyone that's interested in additive manufacturing or manufacturing in general, I think it's a great primer on just like coming up to speed with what's going on in the world right now um, as it pertains to manufacturing. I agree. And the big point that I took away from this is how it highlights when you're doing prototyping or when you're doing precise work in small quantities, it's actually, it's not, it's not just a alternative. It's actually the preferable option given that it's like really reliable from a Mm -hmm. dimensional standpoint and really good from a supply chain standpoint. And I think that that directly addresses how Zeiss is using 3D printed parts in their serial production. You know, they, they have serial production, but it's not in the order of millions and millions of these, you know, high technology optic stuff because of the fact that they're making on making such complex, such high tech stuff. It's probably somewhere in the order of thousands, which is why this 3D printing, solution makes sense absolutely so it's a perfect segue to today's article and as you hinted we're talking about zeiss right but who is zeiss like why why would they even care about additive manufacturing well i'm going to be totally honest with you i didn't know who zeiss was but apparently they're like one of the biggest players when it comes to this like super high precision tooling they've been around for i don't even know how long hundreds of years for hundreds sure. of years they have i think 50 facilities that are just dedicated to manufacturing 30 facilities for R&D. My bad. They're in 50 countries, 30 production sites, 30 R&D facilities. So super impressive. And they typically focus on like metrology and QA tools. So again, measurements and coming up with generally high precision um, tools for like optical sensors, microscopes, et cetera, et cetera. So naturally, um, a lot of different organizations depend on what Zeiss is making. Yeah, I know like, they make lenses for many of the major camera manufacturers. They make microscopes. They make lenses for telescopes. Like basically, if optics is the game, Zeiss is the name. That that was. Did you come up with that on the fly, yeah. or had you have you written that down? It was off the dome. Okay, I'll trust you. I'll trust you. But again, because they are known for measurements, like it makes sense that they've said it themselves. Reliability and repeatability is like their guiding principle. Yeah. Right. I mean, it makes sense. If you have an instrument manufacturer, you want it to be reliable. You want to make sure that the measurement you're getting is good and that you can repeatedly get that good measurement. So well, and, totally and, checks out. I mean, even think about when you're manufacturing something like a microscope mm-hmm. that is going to be handling rays of light and magnifying them thousands and thousands of times, sometimes millions of times, and they have to arrive properly at the sensor, arrive properly at your eye. You have to be so precise in the manufacturing of that machine you know, any minor imperfection or what may seem minor drastically changes the results. Yeah, could yeah. could completely change what the end product work how it works and if it even works at all. Absolutely. So think about specifically, I think what today's article dives into is how they're using 3D printing for microscopes. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're making adapters for microscopes, you've got to be picture perfect 
with the way that you make every single aspect of that interface between two different parts, because otherwise, you know, you're going to lose your optical path and it's not going to work the way it's supposed to. Definitely. Now, when it, like you already hit on one of them, but when it comes to manufacturing, these folks at Zeiss, they kind of have two challenges, right? One is that you're making, just like you said, high precision equipment that you need to make sure as you're shipping it out to someone is calibrated. It's mounted just perfectly. And right now they're like using these brackets and adjustment screws and stuff. So someone is manually putting all this together to mm -hmm. make sure it's right. And obviously like that's a pain. You're introducing human error into this like highly machined piece of, you know, art. But on top of that, we're living in a world where customers needs are becoming more and more customized. Yeah. Right. And you have to meet that somehow. So naturally, um, you would have to, if you're going the traditional manufacturing route, you would have to come up with custom parts, come up with the right tooling, wait for it to get to you. It's going to cost a ton. And that doesn't scale well. So that's where additive manufacturing is coming into play, right? Yeah. That, that's the one of the things here. they mentioned, especially around the human part, mm -hmm. is like you have human interaction. You require humans to be a part of the picture to be able to assemble these things and to, because you know, in many cases you're creating a custom adapter between two different parts because you're using a human in there. You not only have the errors the first time the human sets it up, but then also when you have the human come back and try to counter those errors and do corrections, there's still human error in that second round of corrections. I could see it being, you know, something where you iterate tons and tons and tons of time. And if you can imagine sending parts back and forth between a machine shop, um, it's a you, pain. You finally sense. fit it and it doesn't fit correctly. Yeah. I mean, I can I can already imagine and empathize with the customers of Zeiss and Zeiss themselves on on how this is an issue and how they want to address it. And imagine if you could create something that was a sure shot and would work the first time and it mac you know, it doesn't matter that it, you haven't made this geometry before. Um you can scan the situation, understand what's going on, plot it in 3D, design an adapter manufacture it in a way that's repeatable and in a way that you can trust the dimensions that come out of it. And if it just works first try, that probably feels like magic compared to what they're doing right now, which is like iterating, you know, putting strain in their supply chain by shipping parts back and forth, trying to correct them, machine them, et cetera. Um, I can see why 3D printing feels like the perfect solution for them here. Absolutely. So let's talk about the solution, right? Like we talked, we, we mentioned it earlier. There's like a two prong problem here. One is you need custom parts to meet like this specific demands that your customers are going to have. And two, the probably the most important one is what you had mentioned, which is you need to make sure that whatever you're assembling is actually, you know, able to output with that level of precision that everyone's expecting. So they did something pretty ingenious here. They were like, instead of using those brackets and adjustment screws, what if for every, literally every specific machine that we have, we just make an adapter plate and we allow that to tell us if we've been lining everything up and to make sure that our sensors are they're basically getting light in the right direction and intensity and whatever that it needs to get. And Which these these adapter plates, right? Just just to zoom out and you know make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. These these adapter plates, all they're doing is helping make sure that other pieces of super high tech equipment are aligned correctly. Mm -hmm. um, it replaces just what you're saying, the brackets with the alignment screws, just the 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 human aspect of making sure that things are tweaked and aligned and calibrated properly. They're taking all that human error out and they're replacing it with something, you know, it's probably a 3d printed plastic piece. That's lightweight, exactly. that's low cost. And you remove the entire calibration, you know, adjustment process just by making sure that you have something that's super high precision, super high dimensional stability. And you just 3D print this adapter between the two parts, you pop them in there and it fits perfectly the way it's supposed to. You don't need to adjust with screws or gears or anything like that. I mean, it, to me, it, it takes out the entire painful part of the process, which was adjusting it. And it just, you know, snap, you know, print, print a piece, probably takes a couple hours and then it works. And it scales well, right? Because these folks at Zeiss, they don't have one or two products. They have like entire families of products that have different variations. And for every single one of those, you would need some sort of an adapter plate. And that's where additive manufacturing really comes into play. You can create those custom parts without spending a ton of money. You'll get it fairly quickly. And when it comes to tolerances, I think, again, like the $500 3D printer I have here can print something within a, what, plus or minus 0.1 millimeter. Yeah. That's, that's crazy to think about. That That's like relatively precise. And, right? and let's talk quickly about like how they're doing what they're doing the machines that they're using for this, they're using, go ahead. Before we get into that, 
I, I was going to go into the next problem that they yeah, had, let's do right? It. Because I, I think it goes hand in hand with why they chose what they chose. And the next thing that they needed was really like customized parts, right? So you have, again, customers that want different things, but they might also want different materials, right? Yeah. For different scenarios, they, they might want composites. One person might want like very um, flexible plastics for whatever, or they, they might want a specific jig. Now they can meet all those requirements with, you know, 3D printing. But like you said, now let's transition into how they're able to do this. So take it away. Step one, let's say they will understand the geometry of the mm -hmm. two machines that they're trying to interface together. Um, the angles that the light are going to have to pass through, um, the geometry of the mounting surfaces of these two different machines that they're adapting together. Um, then they will design and you know, digitally they'll design and a unique adapter plate that ensures that the light travels precisely from point A to point B, the way it's supposed to between those two machines. Then this plate is 3d printed using an Ultimaker printer. Um, I think it's important to highlight like Ultimaker's awesome. We're excited about their technology. We've even mentioned them on a previous mm -hmm. podcast episode before Zeiss chose Ultimaker because it's easy to use. It's flexible, consistently delivers reliable results. And that's something we talked about, right? Like being able to 3d print reliably to, uh, you know, a level of dimensional stability that you can trust the parts that come out of it every single time. I think in addition, on top of all this, it's not something they mentioned in the article, but I, you know, intuitively, I feel like this is something that must have been a game changer for them. Um, is the fact that Ultimaker printers are actually like relatively inexpensive. So, bang for your buck, um, in terms of them being able to, like we said at the beginning of this episode, democratize their supply chain. Um, you said they've got operations in 50 different countries. Um, they don't have to have one manufacturing center that's 3D printing stuff and sending them in the mail. These Ultimaker printers are inexpensive enough and easy to set up that they could probably buy a couple dozen of these and set up and have regional 3d printing shops mm -hmm. or even at some point have one 3d printing shop in every single country that they're working in um and it's because we're not talking about a multi multi-million dollar high precision machining machine here like the type of thing that they would have to deal with right now when they're trying to like machine metal when they switch over to 3d printing the paradigm change changes completely the materials are cheaper the supply chain woes are gone and even the machines that you're using to create these parts that have a similar tolerance as like multi-million dollar machining equipment, you know, it, it's, you can probably get it for a couple hundred dollars on Amazon um, and, and get it shipped to your house and you can print it on your desktop, st yeah. you know, starting tomorrow. What I was going to say is I, what really interested me, because Zeiss was talking about their selection, right? As any good engineer would do, they went through the process of like analyzing what's out there and what makes sense for them. So the reason they say they settled in on Ultimaker was... Again, one of their guiding principles is reliability and repeatability. And that's exactly what they got from these Ultimaker printers, right? That's what they need to make their manufacturing dream come true. And Ultimaker provides it. But on top of that, you and I, we've used Ultimaker printers before, but we're very familiar with their slicing software, Cura, yeah. which is used by literally like millions of people. It works on different platforms, super reliable, awesome. But on top of that, they're also part of this, I forgot what they called it, like material alliance which means that the printers are compatible with like a whole host of different um, uh, spools of filament that you, you might want to use. For and I mean, printer. just just imagine the, the wide swath of different use cases that Zeiss's customers have. We talked about everything from cameras to microscopes to telescopes. Mm -hmm. You're going to have different use cases, different requirements for each of those. That's where different material requirements really come, come in. Play. Yeah. Knowing that you've got a printer that can accurately manufacture the part that you need with the correct geometry no matter which material which end use case you're designing it for i mean that that's got to be that's a home run yeah a home run for sure <laughs> and the availability like like you said we we've used the printers before and you can get one from amazon and i don't know that's kind of crazy to think about that someone that's doing manufacturing at that level can use the same kind of printer that high school students might be using for their projects yeah but that's a testament to how good it is right that it can satisfy the needs from like the most basic to the most complex. And I, I think it's also worth talking about like the direct benefits. I think you alluded to the cost, but Zeiss has mentioned, you know, like generically speaking, a part that might've cost them 300 euros is now costing them 20 euros. Yeah. And that's a 94% reduction in cost. And the lead times went from months to days. That's kind of unbeatable. Yeah. I mean, and like, 
I mean, just imagine as a customer mm-hmm. the ex- the difference in the experience there saying you know i've got this unique use case where i need a bespoke adapter plate for my zeiss equipment to work properly um you know previous state you've got to wait months you're going to charge hundreds of dollars hundreds of euros to be able to get this um when it shows up it might not work correctly you might have to make some adjustments we might even have to go back and remanufacture it if mm-hmm. it didn't work correctly all that to the new paradigm with the, with 3d printing with ultimate ultimaker which is you can the part you can get the part in days the zeiss team is able to quickly respond to you because they're able to quickly iterate between product design and development it only costs 20 dollars, and by the way it works on the first try you don't have to do manual adjustments and it's dimensionally correct from the start which is i mean to me it sounds like a win in every single column which is crazy it's a home run yeah. that's the easiest way to put it and i think you, you mentioned it earlier too we had actually talked about another episode. I mean, we, we had talked about Ultimaker in another episode early, early on. Uh, I just looked it up. It was episode 14, like over two years ago. Yeah. How Ultimaker printers were being used in Heineken factories to reduce downtime. But another episode that I just cannot put my finger on, I think it was like one of the first five. We had talked about additive manufacturing and how it's related to aerospace. And we we're talking about how moving it to be on site had advantages that range from, you know, lead time to cost, but also being able to design quicker and validate quicker and get your final production stuff figured out way quicker. Now we're talking about it, you know, two, three years later, and Zeiss, which is like a completely different industry, is doing that exact same process. So it's not even just confined to like high precision tooling. This is a general trend that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I think it's kind of amazing. By the way, that was episode one. So Wow. I don't wow. know, a little bit of next fight trivia. I don't know yeah, if anyone's yeah. still listening that <laughs> listened to episode one when they were there, but um, if you've been there for the entire ride, we appreciate you for being a part of the journey. For sure. For Hopefully sure. there's at least a third person in addition to the two of us. Who's I think my mom at the minimum. Her. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's my, been rocking. My grandpa, my grandpa listens to every single episode too. Look at that, so. four. Yeah. Yeah. Who would have thought? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Not me either. I, I don't know. I think I think at a high level though, I agree. It's super interesting that we get to you know sitting from our perch where we sit reviewing technology looking at technology trends and now that we've done this over a couple of years we can Mm -hmm. start to see these trends absolutely play out and we talked about in episode one about how technology that starts in high tech that starts in aerospace generally ends up trickling down to different parts of uh other parts of high tech first and then eventually it'll trickle down to like consumer available technology um, we're starting to see that exact trend take place here. You know, it's gone from super high cost, building airplanes, building spaceships to like, now we're starting talking about other high tech, right? Optics. Um, I think we talked about Heineken, right? Like in, in beer factories, the, the democratization of 3d printing technology and this being part of the next industrial revolution. I think that's interesting, obviously to see that trend in general, but obviously, I think it's extra exciting for us to see it from the perch in which we sit being a part of the podcast that talks about technology on a weekly basis. And I mean, you covered it, but just a variety of topics that we've talked about is a impressive, you know, you can knock us for a lot of things, but we try to really go out there with the different types of topics that we cover. But on top of that, even among all those different topics, seeing like a convergence of trends, that's one of the most satisfying bits. Like it's, it's almost like you've been gathering all these different pieces of puzzle like, I don't know, I want to say Lego, but I'm just going to stick with puzzle. And now it's finally coming together and you're starting to like get the picture of what's really happening across different industries. And that's, again, super exciting. Um, but yeah, I think we should do a little, little episode recap, a little TLDR. Yeah. What do you think? Why, why don't you try and wrap this up into a nice little package for all of us to, to understand exactly what it was that we talked about. I mean, today. I'm going to do my best. Let, let's see how it goes. It's live, so I'm feeling a lot of pressure here. <laughs> but... We're talking about Zeiss today. Zeiss is a company that produces, you know, high precision, high precision tooling. They have facilities in 50 countries. They have 30 R&D facilities. Big, big player out here. And their guiding principle is repeatability and reliability because their customers depend on something like that. Now, they have two big problems when it comes to their products, right? When someone is manually assembling these things, um, human error can cause precision to kind of be out of whack. But on top of that, their customers' needs are becoming more and more specific, and they have to meet that somehow. So that's where additive manufacturing is coming into play. They're able to leverage additively manufactured parts to make sure that everything is aligned perfectly well, that their precision equipment is actually very precise. But on top of that, 
make custom parts, one-off parts, whatever their customers need to make sure that that tool is getting leveraged exactly to the customer's demands. I think you nailed it, dude. Um, and obviously I love what this means for Zeiss's customers. And mm -hmm. obviously this being a part of a trend for technology for everyone, I think it's exciting to see this make a win for Zeiss, the manufacturer. It makes a win for the customer. Um, it's probably less intensive on the environment. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper for everyone. Everything happens in a shorter lead time. Less materials are wasted. It sounds like the major key to unlocking all that was 3D printing, which yep. is exciting. Um, but obviously, in terms of significance to the world, uh, I, I think, like you, you said it before, but Ultimaker, Zeiss, they've hit a home run here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, before we wrap up the episode, um, I want to quickly mention, we got a review today, and it is from Saudi Arabia. I think this is one, one of the handful of reviews that we have coming from international folks. This is from Abdulaziz. He talked about how much he appreciates that we highlight tech trends in different areas. So we hope, Abdulaziz, if you're listening, we hope you like this episode because I think it really uh, matches that criteria. And thank you for rocking with us. Saudi Arabia has been showing us a lot of love. So yeah. we appreciate all of our Saudi Arabian fans and all of our international fans. And I will say, we'll continue to hold up our end of the deal until there are way too many reviews that we can't which is if you give us a review on Apple, on Spotify, wherever you're listening, and you leave us a little blurb of text on there, we will absolutely shout you out. We, we would love to thank everyone who's a big part of continuing our journey. Again, this is 139, 140 something episodes in. Wild. We've absolutely never wild. missed an episode any week. And a big part of that is the motivation that we get from knowing that we're part of a growing, engaged community. So we appreciate everyone who's a part of that. Absolutely. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.